morning to the book of Acts, chapter 8. Acts, chapter 8. Thankful to see each one that's here this morning. We're glad to be back in the service again. Acts, chapter 8. If you're here and visiting with us, we're thankful that you've come this morning. Trust you receive a blessing from being here. We're going to begin reading in verse 14, Acts chapter 8, verse 14. Before we begin, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day, the blessings of the day, Lord, the many things that you've done for us. I pray, Lord, that you would help us. I pray, Lord, that you, you, you know the very message you've put on our heart this morning, Lord. I pray you'd give me the words to speak. I pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts this morning, Lord, that we could receive your word. I pray you'd give us wisdom, Lord. I pray, Lord, you would forgive us of the ways we failed you. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, bless the request mentioned this morning. You know each one and each need. And I pray, Lord, for those that are lost, that they could see their need of Jesus while there's time and opportunity. Lord, all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 8, verse 14. Now, when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they, excuse me, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, and on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. And Peter, but Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. The sight of God. Repent therefore of this, thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. I'm going to stop there, reading in verse 23. And uh, we, we want to try to use this, this uh, idea this morning, this, this scripture, to get across the thought that's on our heart, and what, what the Lord's given us to try to preach this morning. Uh, we, we come to a time that uh, uh, a man named Simon is saved. And this is Simon the sorcerer, if you uh, are familiar with him, he was a man of sorcery in, uh, in, in Samaria, and he had bewitched many of the people. Uh, Simon had become accustomed with having power in the city of Samaria. And uh, as the disciples came through, as they were preaching Jesus Christ, the scripture says, if you'll notice this in verse 13, that Simon himself believed also. And so uh, there, there's some people who argue about the uh, salvation of, uh, of Simon or whether or not he was truly saved. I, I, I believe that Simon was, and I believe that he was simply because the scripture says that he was, he believed. Uh, he goes on to uh, ask Peter to give him something that he's going to uh, pay money if Peter would give him the ability to, when he lays hands on somebody, that they could receive the Holy Ghost. As that's, he's willing to pay money for that. Uh, he's made a mistake in doing that. We're going to talk a little bit about that mistake here in a moment. Uh, but we want to try to use this again this morning uh, to get across the idea. First off, let, let me say this. What is a saved man capable of? It's important for us to note that as we're reading, as we study the scripture, we, something that we need to get settled in our own mind. What is a saved man capable of doing? Is a saved man capable of committing adultery? Absolutely. If that's not the, if that's not the case, then David's not saved. Is a saved man capable of murder? Absolutely. If that's not the case, then again, David's not saved. Neither would be Moses. We could do this all throughout the Scripture, but we can find out very quickly that a saved man is capable of doing anything 
that a lost man's capable of. The reason being is we still have the flesh to deal with. And so any desire of the flesh that we choose, if you're saved, that we choose to follow, you're capable of doing. And so some people believe that, that saved people are not capable of committing such and such a sin or uh, this kind of idea. And, and, and so because of that, they look at uh, Simon here and they may say, well, a, a saved man wouldn't, wouldn't do this. Well, a saved man's capable of anything. And we're not very careful. We can find ourselves in the very same position that Simon was in. And maybe not necessarily with the exact same sin, although that is possible to a degree. But it could be in, in, in the very same, uh, in, in the idea of what Simon was trying to accomplish and what Simon was doing even unintentionally. We can find ourselves in, in a very similar position. Now what Simon was doing here is he, you, you talk about the idea of money and power. Money and power had taken hold of Simon. It had put a grip on Simon. And Simon was controlled by that before he trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. Before he ever believed he was controlled by that because he bewitched the people. He used sorcery as a means to gain money and power. As if Simon himself really understood that, that he was bewitching the people. It was simply a, a means to an end to gain money and power over people. And that's what he did. And now he's trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, but the flesh is, still has that grip on him. There's still something there that has that grip on him that needs to be overcome and hasn't been overcome to yet. And sometimes, if we're not careful, we can get to the point that the desires of our heart the desires of the flesh control our way of thinking. They control our minds. The idea, this very idea, is the idea of covetousness. And so he's blinded by his own greed, not seeing the fact of, of what he's doing. That he's offering money for the gift of God. He's offering money for what God and only God could give him. Now, Peter and, and these uh, apostles had the power to do this. They had the power to lay their hands, but I don't believe they had the power to do it against the Lord's will. In other words, they couldn't just go to whoever they wanted and, and lay hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. It had to be according to the will of God. And so this was not something that they even had the ability to give. They could not give this away if they wanted to. And so uh, Peter, as Peter goes on to explain that he says, thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. I believe kind of the idea that he's trying to get across with that statement that, that Simon really don't even understand what he's talking about. But he's been blinded by greed. Sometimes if we're not careful, we can again allow our desires to get into the place that they've corrupted our way of thinking. That they've corrupted... Uh, what it is that we're trying to accomplish. And not necessarily just doing the wrong thing, but even trying to do the right thing for the wrong reason. Trying to do the right thing for the wrong reason. And here it is, you look at this man, and, and, and note, I want you to notice this is where we're going to spend most of our time this morning, at the statement that Peter made to him. In, uh, in verse 21, he makes this statement. He says, For thou hast, he says, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for the heart, the heart is not right in the sight of God. This morning I want to ask you a question. Is your heart right in the sight of God? And I want you to notice, Peter didn't say, Your heart's not right with me. We're not in agreement together. But what he's saying is that this issue is not an issue that's between me and you or me and anybody else or, or me and the church and all of this kind of thing. And it very easily could have gotten to that place. But at this point, the most important thing is for him to understand that his no heart, excuse me, his heart is not right with God. This morning is your heart right with God. Have you done things properly? 
Have, have you done things the way that they, they need to be done? Have you done something wrong that you haven't been forgiven for? Is your heart right with God this morning? Are, are you following the will of God in your life? Are you doing what God would have you to do? Or are, you, are, are you accomplishing what He's giving you the task that He has for you? Is your heart right with God this morning? And here this man's tried to purchase the gift of God with money. He's trying to offer money. And, and, and I want us to think for a moment the reason that he did that. I believe that one of the reasons, that, and I know the Scripture doesn't tell us explicitly the reasons that he did this, but I, I believe there's some things that we can kind of dig into it and see. I believe Simon was used to having things go his way. I believe he was used to being in control, and, and, and he was used to having the power in money. And I believe that he quickly missed that and quickly realized in believing that Jesus was the Christ and getting saved that all of that is stripped from him now and he's no longer in that place of power. He's no longer in that place uh, of authority and, and, and having the money. But now the disciples have really taken that place from him and that they're the ones with authority and they're the ones in power. And what Simon does have is he's got money. And so he'll offer him, he will offer them this money if they will give him this power and authority that will again lift him back to the place and lift him up to the place that he would have authority over people and that he, would, he could be lifted up again. What I'm trying to help us see is one of the reasons that Simon was doing this thing is that he could use the gift of God, that he could use what God would give him to bring glory to himself. This morning, have you, ever, have you ever done that? There's a lot of times we can look at things and, and we can see things that, that need to be done. Positions in church. It's everybody that surrenders to preach a God-called preacher. That's a pretty obvious question, no. If that's the case, and we know it is, then why would anybody else want it? And one reason would be to, to, to boast themselves, to lift themselves up to a position of power and authority. Which seems actually quite odd, considering the position is not a position of authority. And that there is no authority to be had. In other words, that, that a person can, not only just that's a simple example, but surrender to preach, but any position that, that we might have, any, any position or place that we would use, whether that be a teacher of Sunday school or whether that be a position in the church or whatever it is that, that we would take, we are stealing glory from the Lord Jesus Christ when we do such things and we use these positions and we use what God has given us and we use His Word and, and His place and, and what we're supposed to be doing from Him to glorify ourselves. We've, we've really put ourselves in the same position that Simon did, very similar. And so Peter tells him that your heart's not right with the Lord. It's not simply that. Uh, it just just that, that one particular thing that would cause us not to be right with the Lord. Any sin can put us in a place where we're not right with God. Living a continual life of sin, habitual sin, uh, would not be right with the Lord. This morning, is your, is your heart right with God? Let, let me, I want to do this in kind of two parts for a moment. First off, if you're here this morning and you're lost, I can prove to you scripturally this morning, if you're here and lost, that your heart is not right with the Lord. I'll give you a couple of scriptures, and, and some folks say, well, well I haven't I have it sinned. 1 John chapter 1, John wrote that in Scripture, again, that was given to us by the Spirit of God through John. And John wrote in 1 John chapter 1 that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. This morning, if you, if you sit and you tell me this morning that you have no sin... There's no sin. There's nothing that you do that's, that's, that, that's, that's sinful. There's no mistake that you made. Whether lost or saved, 
You deceive yourself. Isaiah chapter 53 makes the statement in verse 6. It says, we like sheep have all gone astray. We've all gone in a direction that we should not go. And you get the idea of our shepherd here. And we as sheep, we're going away. We're going a a completely different way than what he would instruct us to go. Than what he would guide us to go. And what he would lead us to go. Our, Our heart's not right with him. This morning's your heart right with the Lord. Every person, every human being that has come and walked on the face of the earth has failed God except one. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. We've all come short of the glory of God. We've all done things that we're not supposed to do. We've all told lies. We've all made mistakes. We've all lust. We've all been covetous. We've all uh, desired to have things we should not have. This morning we're all sinners. This morning if you're lost, your heart's not right with God. You need to be saved. You need to get right with God. You need to be right with God. This morning if you're saved, same situation. We can't sit this morning and, and, and... we, we've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. We've all made mistakes. This morning, I'm not trying to, to sit here and tell you, you, you may be okay. You may have already sought forgiveness from the Lord or something of the nature. But if you haven't this morning and your heart's not right with God, you need to get to God and, and be forgiven of that. This morning, we studied in Sunday school about David. And there was a time that his heart was not right with the Lord. When he numbered the people... And he had sinned. Gad came to him and, and asked him, told him uh, the, the, what the Lord had sent for him and, 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 and the three options that David had. And he was given to choose. And there was a time when David repented of, the, of that. And, and the Lord forgave him of it. And he was right again with the Lord. But for a time uh, there, there was a, a season there that his heart was not right with God. Y'all remember uh, when Peter denied the Lord Jesus Christ. The Scripture, it's amazing, the Scripture made the statement. I I love to preach it when the Lord's not in it, or when the Lord's in it, excuse me. I love to preach it when the Lord's in it, the thought that Peter followed Jesus afar off. As they come and they arrested the Lord Jesus Christ, all of the disciples scattered, and they were taking Jesus uh, in to, to judge him and to, to, to bring him to court, if you will. And the Scripture says that Peter followed Jesus afar off. Well, why did he do that? Well, it was dangerous to be real close to him. It would, it would hurt him. And there's a lot of us that, that we find ourselves, if we're not careful, we're trying to follow Jesus afar off. But we need to be right up close to Jesus. We need to follow him. And, and whatever it means, it means for us. We suffer it, we take it, whatever it means, but we follow the Lord. And there was a time, of course, Jesus told Peter that he was going to deny him, and that time came, and he denied him. He denied him three times. The cock crowed. The Scripture makes a statement that he looked at Jesus, and Jesus saw him. And y'all remember what Peter did? The Scripture says he went out and wept bitterly. Why did he do that? Because he was not right with the Lord. He got right with the Lord. Go back and and even look at what he's doing at this point in time. Peter was a great man of the Lord. But there was a time he wasn't right. He made a mistake. He failed. But he got right. There was a man a little while back who had made a mistake. I'm not going to name the mistake. It's not important, nor the man's name. That's not important either. But he was extremely downtrodden over what had taken place. He was beat down to the point of almost quitting on the Lord. He was walking out of church one day, and there was a preacher there talking to him, and the preacher just told him. He said, there's nothing right now that the devil would love more 
than to get you to quit. He said, you have been a great blessing to a lot of people. And you don't have to stop just because you've made a mistake. Get right with the Lord. Get right with the church. And go on serving the Lord. And today, that's the advice that's on my heart to give you. If you've made a mistake, there's nothing greater that the devil would want to do except get you to quit on the Lord. But if your heart's not right with God, get right with God. Get right with the church and go on and serve God. Keep going for the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, if you, if you put the two books together, you'll find this uh, idea mentioned, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and then 2 Corinthians chapter 7. You can find this there. There was a, a, a particular instance that took place where Paul began to describe the idea of church discipline there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And what he, what he told the church, or actually what had happened, the Scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, that a man had had his father's wife, sin that was so awful that it wasn't even named among the Gentiles, a, a bad one. And rather than the church mourning about it and doing what they should do about it, they were puffed up about it. And that they were, uh, they, they, even the church themselves, their heart was not right with God. This man, his heart was not right with God. They had not removed his fellowship and done what they needed to do. And so Paul called them on that. And Paul, of course, wrote the letter to explain to them what they're supposed to do. And he did in, 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 in pretty rough language. And I'm not meaning, I mean, he was very blunt in what he said to the point that they sorrowed. You can read that in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, verses 7, 8, 9, 10, right in that area. And so he's telling them that, yeah, I, I wrote a letter that, that made you sorry for which I'm not going to, in my own words, I'm not going to apologize for that because you sorrowed to repentance. In other words, you saw your mistake, you saw your error, you saw that you weren't right with God by me letting you know that, rebuking you through a letter through which you got yourself right with God and now you've gone on serving the Lord. I'm not going to apologize for that. That was the whole purpose. When you look at the idea of church split discipline, uh, it, it was, I, I believe this, and, and it may not be the case here, but it's been the case in, in a few different other places that I've been. Discipline for a period of time was done so extremely wrong that it's been completely forsaken. And people have walked away from the idea of discipline, of church discipline. Because the idea for a long period of time it's okay, you've committed a sin. We don't want you numbered with us, and so we're going to get rid of you. That don't, that's not even close to what discipline does. That's not even close to scriptural discipline. I had a man tell me one day, I, I asked him, I said, do you, do you still go to church so-and-so? And he said, no, I, I don't. And I said, what happened? He said, they met under the oak tree, and they threw me out. And so I don't go with them anymore. He began to tell me what, what, what happened and the reason that they did that. And that was the idea. They threw me out of church. First off, let me say this. If the church disciplines you, you're not removed. If you were to pass away, it'd still say on your obituary, member of such and such Baptist church. What it means is that you're a member that's out of fellowship with the church. You're not in fellowship with the church. And the church, you can think of this, the church is instructed to do this and remove your fellowship or their fellowships out with the Lord. Now, you say, well, why do we do this? Why, what's even the purpose of discipline? Well, it's no different than any other discipline. If you discipline a child, it's not fun. How many of us that are parents enjoy discipline our children? It's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my life. I don't like it. But it's needful. It's necessary. And I understand the purpose of it. The Scripture even tells us that he that spareth the rod hateth his son. What's the purpose of discipline? And Peter, or excuse me, Paul makes a statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that what, what a man, what, or excuse me, what the church was supposed to do was to deliver one into Satan for the destruction of the flesh. 
Now that sounds extremely harsh, but let me tell you what, he, what he's trying to get across with that. What takes place is when the church does what they're supposed to do and they remove the fellowship of a person who's committed adultery or had done it, committed a chargeable offense, which are listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The person commits that, the church removes their fellowship, they're delivered to Satan. What that means is God pulls the heads down around that individual and Satan is allowed to come in as he was with Job. Not that Job had done anything wrong, but in this circumstance it's the case. And the, well, the devil begins to wear that person out, if you will. Begins to really give them some trouble. They begin to have a lot of difficulty for the purpose that they would come back and be, and, and, and be made right with the church and that they would be forgiven from the church and that they would repent and come back to the Lord that they could be right with Him and the church once again. The whole point of discipline is to bring a person to the place that they would repent and get right with the church and with the Lord. That's the whole purpose of it. There's been a few occasions that as a pastor I've had to, I had to do it. I, I've, not, I've never enjoyed it. Not once. In all of the years that I've tried to serve the Lord, that's some of the hardest things that I've ever had to do. I sat down with a young lady one day, and this is, this is I, I want to try to give you all the way that I try to go about it so we can understand a little bit about the idea of discipline and its purpose. And I said, this is, this is what you've done. And I said, you, you don't deny that you've committed this mistake. And the young lady told me, I, yeah, I have. And I, I said, uh, can I show you something a little bit scripturally about that? And she said, yeah, absolutely. And so I began to take the scripture and, and show her that the path that she has chosen to live and the path that she's chosen to traverse is a path of sin that is going to lead her to destruction. It's going to lead her to a life of misery. And it's going to destroy her family. And it's going to destroy everything around her. And that we as a church can't sit by in good conscience and watch her destroy her life and not do anything about it. So our only move... Is to, have, is to discipline her as a member of the church that she could see the error of her way and that she could come back to the Lord and that she could have a life and live a life that would be pleasing to the Lord so that she could reap the benefits of sowing to the Spirit which would be life everlasting. Today, the, what, the whole point of that and the reason that I, I mention that is that if you are living a life out of fellowship with God. If you are living a life that your heart's not right with God, you have chosen to live a life of destruction rather than living a life of, of, of everlasting life. You've chosen destruction over joy and peace and love. Why would you make that decision? Why would you choose that? Today, get right with God. And so he makes a statement here. If you're still in Acts chapter 8, I want you to notice this. He says, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. But Peter doesn't just stop there. He doesn't just stop and just say your heart's not right and that's it for you. You have no other choice. But he says, repent. Repent. Therefore of this wickedness, repent of the wickedness. And pray God if perhaps the, the, the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. In other words, that it, it, that what Peter's saying here is not that it's going to be a question. If you repent, God may or may not forgive you. I believe what he's talking about is the sincerity of it. If you truly repent, the Lord will forgive you. And if the Lord doesn't forgive you, it's because you haven't truly repented. It's not a question as to whether or not the Lord's going to forgive us. God is forgiving and He will forgive us. That doesn't mean the consequences for that particular action are going to be gone and we're not going to have to answer for those. And that may be the point that's called into question here. But we're to repent. And Peter makes the statement here. You notice this it's, uh, in verse 21. He says, Thou hast, excuse me, uh, back up to verse 20. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee. 
In other words, that this sin's about to cause you to perish. And I don't believe this was something that Peter was thankful to see. I don't think this was something that Peter desired to see or was real glad about having to tell this man that he was about to die because of the sin that he had committed. And now Peter's saying, repent. And it may be the case, not that just God will forgive you, but God may not bring this on you. You may not have to die if you will repent of this. I want us to understand something for a moment. So oftentimes we, we try to live in a box and we, we, we separate ourselves from everybody else. And we say, well, what I do and the decisions that I make don't affect anybody else. David's sin this morning as we were studying in Sunday school, we studied the time, if you weren't here, we, turned, we studied the time that David numbered the people and about 70,000 men of the nation of Israel died for David's sin. It didn't affect anybody else, did it? Our sins don't just, they, they don't just magically not affect anybody else. What we do affects other people. And we sometimes, we, we, we desire to see our, heart, our, our churches grow. We desire, desire to see things happen and as we're serving the Lord. That begins with us being right with God. What that means is that your sin affects the church. And if you're not right with the Lord, then you need to be right with the Lord for the sake of the church, for the sake of yourself, and for the sake of your family. Y'all remember what God, uh, y'all remember what the book of uh, Chronicles says about a land that if my people, which are, call, which are called by my name, will do what? My people, which are called by my name. Now he's not talking about lost people, he's talking about those that are saved. They humble themselves. I believe there was something about turning what now? Turning from their wicked ways. Quit sinning. Quit living a lives of sin. We would turn from it. The point is that it, it affect, it, 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 even the Lord says in, in this book that it affects the nation that we live in. Today is your heart right with God. And if it's not, it can be. Why wouldn't you want it to be? Why wouldn't you want to be right with God? Why wouldn't you want to live and, and, and be in, in a place where you can once again have joy? You remember David making that statement, Return unto me the joy of thy salvation. Why wouldn't we want to be in that place where we could have joy and, and peace again with the Lord? This morning, if you've chosen to live a life separated from God, if you've chosen to live a life out of fellowship with God and your heart's not right with Him, you've chosen to live a life of destruction. You've chosen to live a life that's going to lead you into corruption. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But this morning, if you'll turn from that, if you'll repent of your wicked ways, if you'll turn from that, as Peter says, and you turn back to the Lord, you turn back and, 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 and repent with all your heart to the Lord. You can be forgiven. Once again, take up a life of joy. Humble yourself before God. Admit what you're doing is wrong. And you come back to the Lord. You can once again live a life of joy and of peace. This morning, if you're here in loss, there's no doubt you're not right with the Lord. You're out of fellowship with Him. You're separated from Him. But you being restored, you're not waiting on God. You're not waiting on God to be restored to Him. You're not looking for the Lord to, 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 to forgive you in that. You've asked Him and, and maybe He will or maybe He won't. The Lord's ready to forgive you right now. And in fact, the Lord is so ready to forgive you, He sent His Son to pay the price of sin for you that you could be forgiven. And this morning, all the Lord requires is that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You accept His Son, the offering for sin. This morning, you, you, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You repent and turn to Jesus, and you can have everlasting life. You can get off the road to destruction this morning. 
Take up the life, that narrow way. You can take up a life of joy if you'll turn back to the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning is your heart right with God while we have a verse of a song.